What do a crazy taxi-like driving game, an auto-runner parkour adventure, a mind-warping puzzle game that bends space and logic, and a minigame-based RPG with fishing, home decor, and museums have in common? Besides blurring genre lines, plenty of upgrades and progression systems, numerous awards, millions of plays around the web, and active speedrunning communities. Souls! Cute, creepy cartoon creations characteristic of Soul Game Studios. Welcome to Two Left Thumbs, this is Flashlight, the series where I document all things Flash related on the internet. In this installment I'm not looking at any particular game or game series, I'm instead looking at several small series that all exist under an umbrella world populated by Soul Kind, whose namesake is shared by its developers. Some may say that naming absolutely everything in your game after Souls, from Soul Game Studio to the Soul Kind to the Soul Ons that they spend, all the way to the Soulcery that they cast, maybe starts to feel like a bit much, but I say never. If you're gonna commit to a concept, you might as well go 100% heart and soul. Soul Game Studios has released five Flash games under that moniker, The Soul Driver, Rogue Soul, The Gentleman, Rogue Soul 2, and Swords and Souls. With their first full PC release, Swords and Souls Never Seen, in stores now. Never Seen is a successor to the original Swords and Souls Flash game without being a direct story sequel. It is obviously still in the Souls universe and utilizes a lot of the core mechanics from that game, but everything has been improved, enhanced, and reworked, sharing a general DNA with the original, but without requiring you to play the original to follow the relatively simple story of Never Seen. You can easily jump straight in. Across their five Flash games, dating back to the Soul Driver nearly ten whole years ago, Soul Game Studios has had one success after another, continuously focusing on quality over quantity. Every game is clean, polished, and easily accessible to newcomers. All coming to a peak with the original Swords and Souls releasing in 2015. It's one of the most beloved Flash games ever, reaching the number one all-time spot on numerous Flash portals, including still sitting at the number one all-time spot of Congregate, one of the biggest Flash portals. Soul Game Studios is the brainchild of two cousins from France who paired up to create the game world of their dreams. My direct apologies to Severin, who has a very distinctly French name, Severin, that I cannot pronounce. Guys, there's a reason I flunked out of French in high school. I'll have to go with the English take on things. So our two cousins are Severin and Adrian. I had the opportunity to interview Severin originally in July 2019, but in the process of updating this video for this channel instead, I recently expanded on that interview, now speaking with both Adrian and Severin this time. I will be sharing excerpts of that interview along the way. The full transcript of that will be over on the Patreon page. There's a link to that down below. Please consider supporting, but only if you have money left Left over after buying Never Seen. Severin details how he grew up making games on paper, naturally progressing to using programs like Paint and finally Flash when he finally had access to a capable computer. His love for games was strong, going so far as to save up as much as he could and buy a secret Game Boy at 12 years old. Adrian's parents were more lenient about access to games, and he and Severin would play all the latest titles together when they spent time together in the summer. Every year there was a one week window where the two could get together and obsess over video games. After many vacations of stealing away their time to play Final Fantasy, Need for Speed, Pokemon, Elder Scrolls, The Witcher, and many more, they eventually started brainstorming their own game ideas. Severin's big brother introduced the pair of them to Flash as a creative tool when they were only about 10 or 11 years old, which he had been using to make dynamic websites. Both started out making drawings and animations before Severin branched out and learned some programming. He showed me a very simple top-down Flash game he found with a car which avoided obstacles. I was excited. At 12, he installed Flash 4 on the home computer, and I started making stick animations with it, then Pokemon fights, etc. I first learned to make a point-and-click minigame, then some hit tests, followed by 10 years of making terrible kid games. Adrian adds in, I was impressed by the ability to make sites much more graphic forward and animated than the other websites of this era. After that, I took Flash 4 and bought a book to learn the basics. Flash development is such an interesting microcosm. With its quick development turnarounds, it's so easy for newcomers to take inspiration from and learn from their cohorts. Severin recalled some of his earliest influences being Undefined's Protector series. 
a merging of RPG mechanics with tower defense gameplay. This being an inspiration makes a lot of sense. That design approach and genre merging is something commonly seen across all Soul Games titles. He also looked to another of Noxon's series, My Pet Protector. While not identical to anything he's done, you can quickly see influences from the battle mechanics, as well as simply the UI where you deck out your character in Swords and Souls. He was also more broadly influenced by Nerduke, who was another developer who was willing to create variety content and always try new genres and pushing their own limits. Other influences include the Epic Battle Fantasy series, with Severin indicating that every Flash creator was likely inspired by Kupo's work there, as well as being attracted to the general polish seen consistently from developers like Juicy Beast. Adrian, on the other hand, took more of his own inspiration from Flash cartoons like Happy Tree Friends and a few obscure titles seen on the Miniclip website. It appears they were always destined to settle into roles of artist and programmer. They knew early on that they wanted to have that Rayman-style detached limbs. You know, just to make things easier to animate. The earliest version of the character was a weird giant egg head body combo. It's something very quite strange. He was eventually given a big hat to mask his face, and then the yellow eyes to help them stand out on the black. Things evolved and took shape from there, and we've had the distinct soul look ever since. Jumping ahead a little bit, if you play the Soul Driver today, their first game, you might be surprised by the level of polish. The art, the design, the gameplay, all of it feels like they were coming from developer veterans. In reality, this is their first released game. We did make a lot of them before that. I had hundreds of personal game projects ranging from two-line text documents to crappy finished games, including loads of prototypes and unfinished RPGs. Adrian and Severin even attempted to challenge themselves with personal game jams of sorts. Could they finish a shared idea they had within a week of vacation time together? After so many attempts and half-finished projects, they knew they wanted to properly complete and release a game. And after nine full months, in 2012, the Soul Driver was finally ready to release. Properly sharing a game online and making a bit of money on it changed everything. Speaking of changing lives, a friend of mine, Jake Friend to be exact, is launching a Kickstarter for their dream project, Scrabdackle, on March 16th. If you like cartoony action-adventure titles that blur the line between genres, and if you're watching this, I'm guessing you do, please consider giving that a look. The landing page is live now, campaign right around the corner, there are links down below I'll remind you at the end of the video. Severin actually interviewed with Game Sauce in 2016. It was a really detailed and well done interview. I'm going to lace in a few excerpts from that as well. They asked a few really good questions, things I didn't think to bring up. So whenever I'm using a clip of the interview from Game Sauce, I'll make sure this is on screen somewhere. And there will be a full link to that interview in the description. Talking about how he had been working as a music instructor while trying to finish the Soul Driver. I think most of us aim at perfection when we create things, even if we never reach it. But I think some devs are just more reasonable than I am when it comes to budget and deadline. Sometimes I spend a whole day on an invisible detail. I basically only stop when I'm so out of cash that I can't continue. Carrying on, it's just that I really value players' enthusiasm a lot. It's extremely rewarding for me, even more than money. We just want to make games that people love. And yeah, sure, if I get rich in the process, awesome, but that would be a consequence, not a goal. The two went full-time working on Rogue Soul. From personal experience, going full-time on Flash is a massive step with no guarantees. I certainly never made it work. Projects take longer than expected. The sponsorship market can be super unstable, meaning your paychecks are few and far between. Maybe your partner backs out halfway through. Your game is released, but it didn't catch on. You took too long developing, and someone else beat you to a similar premise that's more popular. The Flash game market is quick, short-lived, and volatile. The risks of going full-time there are enormous. But luckily Severin and Adrian had each other and could trust each other to be reliable. Looking back briefly at the different games they made together, almost all of them share some form of levels, upgrades, progression, bosses, with all sorts of silly flares interwoven throughout. In The Soul Driver, you're a thief on the lam trying to outmaneuver the police in your scrappy little car. In the Rogue Soul game, you're playing through an auto runner. But rather than the usual mechanics of jump and duck, that's interwoven with much more intricate platforming and even small combat systems. 
It's also a game that Severin is particularly proud of. Of Rogue Soul, I'm proud because it tried to bring some depth to simple Flash runners. Never have I been that excited to run around, jump on platforms, and beat enemies. I'm very proud of the depth the game offers after hours of gameplay. The Gentleman kind of takes things a step back. We don't even have soul in the title. This game is a slower pace than we're used to seeing from these two, but with trademark flares and creativity. It starts out as a pretty simple puzzler, but in almost no time at all as more and more mechanics are layered in, you realize how much depth there is to this title. Interestingly, despite being their third released game after the Soul Driver and the original Rogue Soul, Severin views the gentleman as being the most poorly designed. I had to follow up after a comment he left on my own gameplay video of the gentleman. Paraphrasing a rather lengthy response and list of grievances, the hazards move too fast and the hitboxes are limited to clunky squares that don't often match what is seen on screen. The difficulty jump in mid-game is too high, with the gameplay not being rich or juicy enough to ask perfection and require so many attempts and time from the player. And in general, the pace and rhythm of the game's progression is spiky and discouraging. New mechanics aren't fully explored or developed in the intended elegant sense. This actually led to an interesting take on matching up game feel and concept. Plus, difficulty doesn't help reinforcing the theme of the game which was more about classy execution than brute force tryhardness. Overall, Severin simply wished he had playtested the game with more people, as he likely would have had the majority telling him it was too hard. In terms of development stumbles, The Gentleman is definitely viewed as the exception. I don't have this many complaints with our other games, of which I'm mostly proud of their game design. Now, this video hypes up Swords and Souls a lot, but this is far from the only game these devs are known for. Rogue Soul 2 is similarly one of the most well-received Flash games of all time. The original Rogue Soul was an exciting and satisfying autorunner, with the loose premise of the titular Rogue Soul stealing treasures, killing guards, and causing other havoc to rack up the greatest Solon bounty possible, trying to outrank the current most wanted bandit in the city, Boren Hood. The game offered loads of challenges, loot to collect, customization options, unlockables, and more to equally satisfy anyone who wanted to play the game for a quick 5 minute run, or someone who wanted to spend hours 100%ing the full thing. Honestly, that balance of catering to either audience is probably the biggest strength of the Soul Game Flash titles. The casual player will have a great experience, and the fans will keep coming back. It's no wonder their games have such high view counts, as well as super high ranking scores. No matter the time you're willing to put in, you're going to have a blast. Rogue Soul 2 then really takes this to the next level. The game brings more of a focus on story with actual levels to progress through, eventually allowing you to unlock alternate game modes. Besides having more feelings of progression and additional challenges with star collection and grandpas to save, there were also boss battles. You have three chances to defeat the boss before the game requires you to redo the level. I struggled with the bosses as is. I couldn't personally take on the arena modes that include a boss rush, as well as the ability to fight specific duos of the bosses at the same time, and once you've conquered that, all three bosses at once. The planning it takes to craft the bosses in a way that their challenges can be layered together like this is so cool. Everything here is a little more refined. While the first game was excellent, the platforming, combat, movesets, and skills all feel so smooth and exhilarating. It took one of the most satisfying Flash games and damn near perfected it. In our updated interview taking place a year and a half after the first, well after Neverseen's release, I decided to test my luck on some possible insider info. No sequel for now, but Rogue Soul 3 is on our mind all the time. In 2014 and 2015, around the time of Rogue Soul 2's development, Severin found time to take part in a few game jams while Adrian was busy with other full-time work. In his very first formal game jam appearance, Ludum Dare 30, with the theme Connected Worlds, he created Galactic Dump and actually took home the bronze for both the adherence to the theme and in the overall jam. I had never worked on a pure puzzle game before, so it was nice to check that we could do puzzles as well. It also meant that the experience I had accumulated working with Flash was allowing me to impress people with high quality polish in just 72 hours of work. Since many comments were actually skeptical about the possibility of achieving such a result in such a short amount of time, that was really satisfying and motivating. Severon also took part in Ludum Dare 31 and 33. 31 had the theme Entire Game on One Screen, for which he created The Ship 
shift. A monochrome, fast-paced platformer where the game rotates each time you kill an enemy, ensuring that the player needs to remain fully alert as the perspectives flip around. This game feels very much in line with Severin's typical design sense. You can just feel that Soul game influence, even if it doesn't have Adrian's art and the Soul characters themselves. And 33's theme was You Are the Monster, for which they made Drumster, a rhythm-based game where you play the drums and become crazier and evolve alongside the musical style. All until a third level, where you become a literal monster demon hammering alongside a hardcore metal soundtrack. This makes sense for someone so musically talented and someone who had previously worked as a music instructor. When asking about what he felt he got out of game jams, Severin answered, I mostly use game jams to have fun creating games with friends, and mostly for the pleasure of completing something fast, a feeling you miss when you work on multi-year projects. I focus on making game designs that fit in the jam's theme and scope and are not necessarily worth expanding. Seemingly, there's no particular genre these two can't tackle. And similar to a developer like The Behemoth, everything that they work on is distinctly a Soul Game Studio game. And I would say that goes beyond that aesthetic. There's a lot of thought and foresight put into the design, the layout, the intricacies, how different mechanics start to fold together the further in the game you are. It goes to show maybe they learned a thing or two, putting in endless hours into analyzing other games and experimenting with their own prototypes before developing full games. Regarding genres, although we are not imprisoned in a specific genre, we are clearly leaning towards the action side of things. And all of our games are in some part a skill-based experience. I couldn't explain why exactly. It's like when I create a mental picture of a game, it almost always starts by a soul doing something and most of the time it's fighting other things. I'm basically a 12-year-old kid playing with cars, soldiers, and knights who has learned to code. I saved this for a little later in the video because I didn't want to spend forever on inspirations before even talking about any of their released games. But Severin spoke to GameSauce about some non-game inspirations for his work that I thought was so fascinating. A big part of my inspiration comes from music. When I was 14, I wanted to make an epic and melancholic RPG out of the third movement of the Concerto No. 2 from Machmaninoff. And we did start working on it. It was called Final Quest. He was nice enough to provide a very old work in progress file for this game. There's not a lot to show, but what a fascinating project, especially for a 13 year old. I also drew a lot of energy and inspiration from my practice of piano, drum, and guitar, especially in my early years as a dev. Dream Theater played an important part in that. This musical influence makes a lot of sense for someone who then worked as a music teacher. There were also some literary inspirations. Tolkien, of course. That was the ultimate heroic fantasy for my teenage years. I read tons of other stuff, but I'm not sure that directly influenced our games. Looking at this soul universe as a whole, I was curious to what extent they consider these games connected, why the cousins chose to pursue development through the lens of a singular world of souls, and whether that conceptual framework for each game has felt limiting or liberating through the years. Personally, I think all souls live in a parallel universe where all kinds of crazy adventures happen. Some of them might be close to others, after all, you do find a top hat on the Swords and Souls training room shelves. I think souls evolve in a large universe without a defined period of time, where everyone could cross paths. So if we wanted, Soul Driver could meet Rogue Soul. That soul design and concept came from an old RPG of theirs, Battle of Warland. Severin had to share a small laugh reflecting on that one. Here is a screenshot from the combat prototype. It was horrible to play. After pulling this back up, Adrian noticed, maybe some enemies I made for this game are in Swords and Souls. Oh yeah, in the original Flash game. Mosquito, Sick Bat, Giant Fly, Mage, the Grumpy Troll, all those were from Battle of Warland. But this project ended up being beyond their capabilities at the time. The game was abandoned, but they had fallen in love with the characters Adrian had designed. Souls naturally became a framework for our minds to picture the games we wanted to make. It's actually incredibly empowering to have an existing universe and design style in mind when conjecturing about possible gameplay. It doesn't just help me coming up with an idea and saving a lot of mental energy. It makes the whole process more exciting for me as we keep adding new episodes to the series. I honestly don't think I'll ever be tired of creating Souls adventures. 
Through each new game, the pair have greatly improved and refined their tool sets and talents. The programming, design, art, sense of gameplay, and progression have all been improved. Even in a game like The Soul Driver, a simple police chase game can inform lessons that can be carried over to other titles. I'll always remember not to downgrade your initial gameplay just for the sake of adding upgrades. The car is barely playable at first. Expanding on this with a snippet from the Game Sauce interview, open your eyes to criticism and feedback. When a user says something about your game, good or bad, most of the time there's something to learn from it. Embrace it, instead of denying it and defending your baby. It's difficult because it's your baby, but like in all forms of creation, we should always try to learn from our mistakes. With each and every game providing a new lesson and helping expand the soul world, Swords and Souls felt to the pair like a crowning achievement of sorts. They had a newfound confidence, and knew now that they fully had the ability to envision a concept and fully realize it to a playable, cohesive, feature-complete game. They had moved beyond the different limitations of time or programming. If there was something they wanted in the game, they were going to find a way to make it. I don't think we're the kind of creators that will bring new genres to the table or unique experimental games. We're just too passionate passionate gamers who want to share their take on different genres, mashing up what we love to offer something unique, yes, but not groundbreaking or anything. Swords and Souls has a really unique gameplay loop. You can go to a training grounds and play different mini-games, blocking incoming projectiles with your shield, trying to chop things with your sword, practicing your archery, or maybe your mage skills. This is primarily how you're earning stats rather than going out into the world and fighting enemies. Although, yeah, you can do that too. You layer this together with these tiny milestones and pieces of progression, you see these amazing explosive improvements in your character. You then take what you can out into the field, battle your way through enemies and progress the story, take the money that you earn from there back to the training grounds and then expand on that. The more you expand it, the more quickly and easily you're then able to stat your character up to get ready to take on the next wave of enemies out in the field. This loop always keeps the gameplay fresh, you have total freedom of where you want to focus Focus your efforts, and anytime you're stuck on either a mini game or a battle, there's always some new option for you to turn to to improve through instead. And while the better you are at it, the quicker you'll improve, it doesn't act as a hard wall. You may struggle on some mini games more than others, I certainly did, but even when you perform them poorly, you still get incremental improvements. And if you're totally stuck, the game does offer other avenues to buy your way through that improvement. Not enough to skip anything of the game, but enough to alleviate any of those obvious potential hang-ups and frustrations. Mix that in with other managerial worries and responsibilities, side tasks and extra add-ons. This game does feel wholly unique. Honestly, with these different mini-games, it's like five different competent Flash games put together, and then a sixth, much larger, battling turn-based RPG on top of it all. Rogue Soul 2 was notable for having an incredible amount of content for a Flash game, and Swords and Souls blows it out of the water. You can play this game for hours and hours and hours and hours, always trying to improve and outdo yourself. It is absolutely fantastic, and if someone would have asked me to pick which of their games I most wanted to see a sequel to, I would have picked Swords and Souls. Rogue Soul 2, I can't even begin to comprehend how you expand on and improve that game. Swords and Souls was so obviously ripe for expansion. More equipment, new enemies, making it more story-driven, added side tasks and challenges, more variety and improvements and overall tune-ups to the mini-games, and the end result of Never Seen it is so fantastic. After a move from Flash to Unity, it's time to revisit those concepts and the Soul world. With a more fleshed out story, more engaging combat, and evolving training minigames, Severin highlights the world map exploration, having pets and allies to fight with, the variety of weapon and equipment types, and improving upon the core minigames to be more unique and more fun. These are all improvements that can be credited to their growing experience as developers. It's sort of a universal idea in design, making sure that no parts of your design are void of intent. How do they connect to our experience? How do they fit in our story? It's a simple lesson, but easily forgotten, and it's often difficult to identify voids of intent that could be filled and help solidify the overall game design. In the time since the original video, I actually completed a full playthrough of Never Seen on the Let's Play channel, as well as videos on all their original Flash games as well. The game spans six chapters, each of which have taken me at least two hours. On top of the training and combat, there's fun asides like fishing, completing a museum, venturing out like a Pokemon trainer to catch pets, upgrading your home and training grounds, as well as a post-game endless mode with randomized encounters. You're in store for many, many hours of gameplay. 
Not to mention you might feel the desire to do a second playthrough, to test out new gear, pets and skills, maybe seek new achievements. Maybe also join in on that speedrunning community. People have already managed to shave that normally 12 plus hour playthrough into two and a half hours. So if you want to work your way up and take down the top speedrunner, claim that elite status for yourself, you better get started. The Soul Game Duo were able to disclose some performance metrics now that the game has been out for over a year. We just reached 100,000 units sold, which is amazing and definitely outmatches our expectations. Thanks to all the players who supported us, we will be able to fund our next project by ourselves, which is a luxury I'm most grateful for. It worked more than I expected. I thought the legacy and the flash rendering can be a negative point for the sales, but it's not. I am beyond elated for these two, and after gushing about their skills and reveling by proxy in their newfound success, I wanted to round out the interview asking a few silly questions for them to answer about Neverseen. Do you have a single favorite enemy design? Or maybe armor, weapon, or item design? Snoofy is for sure my favorite pet and enemy. As for armor, I love the Guardian armor, definitely my favorite. I love the Warthog family. Do you prefer the battling or the training? <laughs> I don't know. I tried so hard to make both core gameplay balanced and intertwined that I can't seem to find sense in one without the other. <laughs> and with a much more direct answer, kicking ass, battling. Which of the mini games is your personal favorite? Probably the range one. The idea to train by shooting targets fed completely into my archer fantasy. I like the archery one. Very smooth and enjoyable. I want to leave everyone with this excited quote from Severin talking about the game. I'd like people to know that making this game has been my sole purpose for four years, without a single moment where I didn't think about it. I just hope that that'll show and that people will appreciate the game. Plus this encouraging sentiment from Adrian that I think many Flash developers and other small indie creators alike could take inspiration from. Even a small game from a Flash game legacy can find its place on Steam as well as this small little tease of what's to come next from Soul Game Studios, something they aren't fully working on just yet while they focus on supporting Never Seen. I have so many ideas that what we make next will be a tough choice. I think we'll pursue whatever makes sense when the time comes. We'll see what excites us to pursue. Spoiler alert, it'll probably involve souls. Obviously, 18 months later, they were able to disclose a little more on what irons they have in the fire. We started working on a new soul license centered around knighthood, but it was looking like a huge project, so we paused that to work on Mini Shoots Adventure, a non-soul minigame, a quick side project before getting back on track. We just started speaking about Mini Shoot on our Discord. A release is probably set for 2021. The game is planned to be a minimalist shooter mashed up with adventure and exploration. The classic combining of two game types the Soul Boys are known for. There is a gameplay loop of shoot, explore, upgrade, level up, acquire skills, and continue to explore. In addition to Mini Shoot and the prospect of a possible Rogue Soul 3, they've also teased the possibility of some never seen spin offs. It's so amazing to see Soul Game Studios come far enough to have the freedom to experiment, take their time, and potentially juggle multiple projects. As promised, I can elaborate a bit more on Scrabdackle. I've been helping out behind the scenes with this game for months, consulting on the Kickstarter and working to support this project that I strongly, personally believe in. This is not a paid ad, this is a fan trying to boost a game I think deserves it. Scrabdackle is a non-linear, exploration-based game about a wizard's first adventure. The game offers loads of lore and secrets to discover, engaging combat and thrilling boss fights, as well as quirky humor and undeniable charm. All made by one developer. I am in love with Scrabdackle. I implore you to visit the Kickstarter landing page, give it a follow, keep an eye on that in the coming weeks, and please consider backing once March 16th rolls around. Thank you for hearing me out on that. I'm sorry for potentially pulling your wallet in so many directions at once. I understand if you have to limit yourself to one or potentially none. The fact that you watched and listened at all already means the world. After all those years of work and teases, I'm so happy to see that Never Seen is finally available in stores. I've been having a ton of fun with it and would highly recommend it. I would say you can go and play any of their free Flash games. If you're interested in this, try out Swords and Souls first, and understand that everything that you like about it is expanded and improved upon, and anything that you find slows down the gameplay or bogs you down was either cut or reworked. It serves as an excellent little demo to see if you're into this idea of training-based minigames, semi-autonomous combat, and battling your way through hordes of enemies. In the end cards here, I'll have a link to my own playthrough of Never Seen, as well as 
as a playlist of other flashlight titles. There is plenty there with plenty more to come that I'm very excited about. There will also be a link up to our Patreon if you want to see that interview in its entirety. I'll be announcing upcoming flashlight videos ahead of time over on the Patreon and opening it up for supporters to submit their own questions to ask for developers. I'm very excited about that prospect. I think there will be some really unique opportunities there. I really love combining these interviews and retrospectives and personally reliving and adding new depth to my own personal experiences with these games and series. Updating and revising these videos has been great as well. This one used to be 10 minutes. I don't like how half-baked it was, and I'm so excited to be expanding old flashlight videos and giving these creators the attention they deserve. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.